to talk about what we mean when we're talking about grand strategy. What is it anyway? Um, if you take the, the universe of knowledge, so the Eddy University has this divided up, uh, you can say there's um, <coughs> physics, chemistry, biology, um, zoology, um, sociology, uh, economics, political science, um, philosophy, history, literature, art, music, mathematics. If you take this wheel and you turn it around sideways like this, let's say this is an automobile tire, you turn it around so it looks like this. Then the social sciences are coming more and more this way, moving up. So what's the difference between this and this? <coughs> the difference is this is the grand strategy area. In any culture, at any time in history, it is generally the case that people aren't aware that they're in that culture. In the medieval period, people didn't know that they were living in a scholastic intellectual world, but they were. And my point here is that we don't know, increasingly, we don't know that we're living in a world in which we have less ability to make decisions than we are. If you look at this as, say, the departments of a university, but then you think of the professional schools, and that's what you are. You have all come from a professional school. What's the professional school? Law, medicine, business, diplomacy. That's about it. But if you take those and overlay them here, you'll see that you are more, you're more inclined to understand this than this fragmented picture would tell you. And maybe the business school person is more understanding of what I've been talking about by far than the people who are in the, these departments. Because if you are a CEO, you have to, I mean, you just absolutely have to pay attention across these, these boundaries. You've got to, you've got to be concerned with your supply chain. You've got to be concerned with personnel. You've got to be concerned with the local economy. You've got to be concerned with the environment. You've got to be concerned with Washington regulations. You've got to be concerned with quality control. You've got to be concerned with marketing. You can't say, I'm only, this is where CEOs really fail. And I saw out of four or five CEOs in the company I was a director of, we had five, four failed. They failed because they could never break out of the, the box. Because they were, it's was, it was the, the Peter Principle. Anybody know what the Peter Principle is? Pardon me? 
Right. Peter principle is you rise to the level of your incompetence. In other words, you are you do this job perfectly, so you're promoted. You do this job perfectly, this one perfectly, you're put, then you're promoted to a job you can't do. And that happens to the CEO again and again and again and again. So you get a guy who is the chief financial officer, who is the greatest chief financial officer you can imagine, he gets promoted to CEO, and he can't do it. Because, why? Because he keeps being the CFO. He never stops being the CFO. So what does this mean? When I say they can't get there. It means that, number one, I can go through maybe three of these. Uh, number one, when you're up here and you're the, you're the boss, you're the CEO, that you have to decide before you can know. You have to decide before you can know. That is, if it took 10 years for a university's political and social scientists to conclude that if you wanted to raise the number of voters in election day, you could, you can't wait that long. You can't wait to run the numbers. You can't wait to get an advisory opinion from the SEC. You can't wait to see whether uh, you're going to get a shareholder suit against you or not. The decision, if, if you wait for, for, for those, if you wait for the social science scientists to give you their predictions, the opportunity or the danger, the opportunity is gone and the, or the danger has hit you. This is a huge intellectual thing that we all need to grasp. And that is, life as it is lived is more complicated and more fast moving than the intellectual methodologies that we have will allow. You just have to. So what do you do with that? I think that the difference is that this so science is reaching up to here, but up here, it's not a science. It's an art. It's the art of statecraft, or the art of the CEO. It means that you have to have the ability to see things all, at a, uh, all at, a, at, a, at a glance. You've got you've to acquire the ability to sense something. And people say, that's ridiculous. That's not, that's not numerical. It's not provable. It's not scientific. It's not responsible. How can you explain that when they, when the, they come and say you violated some regulation? But you still have to do it. You absolutely have to do it. Or you will fail. And most people can't do it. Not because people are, as a general matter, too dumb or too uh, constrained intellectually to do it. Uh, they don't do it because they don't, th they don't think that it exists. Another illustration of what we're talking about here uh, comes from uh, Clausewitz. Uh, Karl von Clausewitz, uh, the author of uh, On War, um, written in the aftermath of the Napoleonic um, Wars. Uh, Clausewitz talks about Napoleon there. 
and he is <coughs> talking about the Italian the Italian front Napoleon uh, this is 1797. Napoleon is a young general here, uh, and he is pursuing an Austrian army. He's trying to get away from Napoleon. He's chasing this uh, Austrian army. This is the frontier here. And the Austrian general turns north. Up here on the Rhine, I think it is, um, there is an Austrian force and a French force on the other side of the river. So there are, in Clausewitz, there are three major concepts um, that hold the book together in some way. So the question Napoleon has here, as the Austrian army moves north, he uh, says, well, he has to decide what's going on here. And his decision is, they're trying to link up with the Austrians on the river. So if I turn and pursue, this is my first decision. If I tur turn and pursue this force, they will link up here. The French on this side can cross the river and will smash the whole Austrian army like hammer and anvil. But it smash the whole thing. But the first concept in German is friction. Good. Here comes Professor Bach. He can he can he can correct my German. <laughs> the the first concept is friction. The con that things never go as you think they're going to go. That is, whatever you think you're going to do, it's not going to work out that way. You know, as General Eisenhower said. Uh, all plans are useless, but planning is essential. So Napoleon, with his first de decision to make, says, this is a case of friction. If I chase this Austrian general up here, I know, or I suspect, that the French forces on this side of the river are not really ready. They're not ready. And if I expect them to cross the river, I'm going to be mistaken. And what I do if I chase them, I'm going to meet the whole Austrian army all by myself up there. So Napoleon says, I'm not going to do it. So he doesn't do that. <clears throat> the second decision should Napoleon then decide to take Vienna. Should he turn this way toward the Austrian capital and seize that and win the war? The second concept which is untranslatable, means what? <laughs> well, you have pairwise interaction of different things. Something that changes here affects something over That's there. good. Pairwise interaction of different things. Um, it's mutual altering. That is, you know, I do something, and when you see what I'm doing, you do something other than you otherwise would do because you see me doing it, and then I do something different because I see you reacting to what I've been, I've been doing. What did you call mutual? Mutual altering. Yeah. So Wechselwirkung, he Napoleon says, if I do this, 
what's going to happen is the Austrian forces in Vienna are going to go out of the city. I don't know this territory well. And they're going to go out and, and into the surrounding countryside. I'm going to get up here, and they're going to be hitting me from every angle. And I'm going to be at the end of a long logistic line. And the mutual altering here is if I do this, they're going to do that. It's not going to be to my advantage. And so he doesn't do this. His third decision Critique means something like we've been talking about. That you stand back and you look at the whole thing, the entirety, and in, in military terms, it's called the eye of command. You can see this in Julius Caesar at the beginning of Caesar's book on the Gallic Wars. You get the sense that Caesar is looking at the whole terrain, the whole theater from Rome up into what we now know as Switzerland. He sees the whole thing as though he's in an airplane looking down on it. And Napoleon does that here. And he, he then sees what is going on back in Paris, the political scene there, as well as all of this. And he then, the Treaty of Campo Formio, he signs a treaty which takes the whole front out of the war and gets France some territories up to the north of France, near Belgium anyway. And this is treated back in Paris as a brilliant move. Napoleon returns to Paris, and it really kicks off his rise to power. Now the, so that's, that's seeing the whole thing at a glance. What is interesting here is that In the novel War and Peace, now it's now 1812, Napoleon marches on Moscow with winter coming. And what happens here is exactly what he said would happen here. Russian forces come out around here and start harassing him and Napoleon has to has to retreat he's defeated so something happened between 1797 and 1812 to Napoleon and in a way that's what the novel war and peace is about you can see Tolstoy never tells you you can just see it you can see Napoleon because he now, he's the emperor and he now is full of himself. He's now arrogant. He's now all knowing. He's perfect, he says to himself. And Tolstoy describes Napoleon coming to the battlefields outside of Moscow and Napoleon, give me the telescope. you can get the sense that what he's seeing through the telescope is this much of the battlefield. Not the whole battlefield. It's the, it's the opposite end of the critique, seeing things from 30,000 feet. It's just seeing 10 square yards or something. Or he, he pulls out a map of the territory, but the map is four years old. It doesn't hold up anymore. So <clears throat> putting forth this as an example of what we're talking about here, once you have it, you could lose it. 